Section 10 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 Parliamentary Reform and After, 1830 to 1833, Part 2. That the Reform Acts of 1832 constituted a great political and parliamentary achievement will be denied by none. Before, however, an attempt is made to estimate its real and permanent significance, a few words may be said as to the part played in the struggle by individuals. Throughout the whole crisis the King's behaviour was, by general consent, admirable. Not only was his conduct entirely correct in the constitutional sense, but he bestowed much time and thought in going over every part of the plan, examined its bearings, asked most sensible questions. Lord Grey himself bore similar testimony. The king's noble conduct is indeed a just theme for praise, and entitles him to all our gratitude and all our zeal in his service. To the general principles of the bill, he gave a cordial assent. As to the means by which it was forced through one branch of the legislature, he had grave misgivings. How far they were justified is still a matter of controversy. In the Commons, the lion's share of the work fell to Lord John Russell, ably supported by Lord Altrip, but in the Cabinet they were strongly backed both by Graham and Lord Durham but neither the king's closet nor the cabinet nor the commons was the scene of the real conflict over reform the key to the position was in the house of lords it was the lords not the monarchy nor the commons who were fighting for their political lives for a century and a half the peers partly in their own chamber still more through their nominees in the lower house had been the real rulers of England. In 1832 they were called upon to surrender a trust which they had administered, on the whole with conspicuous fidelity and success, albeit by methods which the public opinion of today regards as indefensible. That they were blind to the new forces, political, social, and economical, which the last half-century had generated, may be imputed to them for stupidity, but not for unrighteousness. Nor can it be denied that their estimate of the results to be apprehended from reform was nearer the mark than that of their opponents. Lord Grey himself represented his proposals as aristocratic. His colleagues hoped that an effectual check would be opposed to the restless spirit of innovation. The Whigs generally believed that the bill was at once conservative and final in its terms. Nothing would have amazed them more than to learn that they were opening the floodgates to the tide of democracy. Neither the Whig aristocracy, who introduced the first reform bill, says a philosophical writer, nor the middle class, whose agitation forced it through, conceived it to be, even implicitly, a revolutionary measure. The power of the Crown and of the House of Lords were to be maintained intact. The House of Commons was to be more representative, but not more democratic than before. The change was regarded as one of detail, not of principle. In no sense a subversion of the Constitution, but merely its adaptation to new conditions. The Duke of Wellington judged it far more shrewdly. There is no man who considers what the government of king, lords, and commons is, and the details of the manner in which it is carried on, who must not see that government will become impracticable when the three branches shall be separate each independent of the other, and uncontrolled in its action by any of the existing influences. It is true that the full force of the shock administered in 1832 was not felt for at least two generations. 
despite organic change the government of england continued to be aristocratic in personnel at least until eighteen sixty seven nevertheless it is a sound instinct which assigns to eighteen thirty two the real point of transition from aristocracy to democracy the changes of eighteen sixty seven and eighteen eighty four were implicit in the earlier revolution that these changes were neither foreseen nor intended by lord grey and his colleagues is true but it is nothing to the point they opened the gates the capture of the citadel was merely a question of time the instinct therefore which led the lords to resist to the last the proposals of reform was from their own point of view perfectly sound with the passage of the bill their political death warrant was signed that an extensive measure could have been much longer deferred few people on either side believed and events have more than justified the general belief though reform was inevitable the act by which it was accomplished was open to grave criticism that it cruelly disappointed the hopes of the working classes was conclusively proved firstly by the chartist agitation and secondly by their refusal to support cobden and bright in their crusade against the corn laws neither then nor later had the whigs any intention of satisfying democratic aspirations still less did their bill satisfy the philosophical liberals it was based not on principle but on expediency it darned and patched it abolished some of the more flagrant abuses but it left innumerable anomalies it broke the principle of aristocracy without admitting that of democracy representation was based neither on numbers nor wealth nor education worst of all in view of the philosophers no effort was made to secure representation for minorities none the less the whigs had a great achievement to their credit and if in eighteen forty eight the epidemic of revolution left us scathless we must thank the legislation of eighteen thirty two not less than that of eighteen forty six no time was lost in testing the temper of the new constituencies after an interval no longer than was needed for the arduous work of registration parliament was dissolved on december third and the elections began forthwith in some places rioting occurred but on the whole the new machinery worked smoothly and the elections were conducted without serious disturbance the polls went as was to be anticipated strongly in favour of the ministerialists orator hunt was defeated at preston where as in other ancient boroughs the effect of the reform act was to circumscribe the constituency and cobbett though afterwards returned for oldham failed to secure election at manchester it is difficult to state with precision the disposition of parties in the new parliament no two contemporary estimates agree nor is this remarkable for party lines were a good deal blurred the conservatives to adopt the name by which crocker had recently rechristened the tory party numbered something between one hundred and forty three and one hundred and sixty seven the ministerialists are variously estimated at anything between three hundred and eighty two and four hundred and ninety one the latter figure including all who were not tories but the radicals numbered seventy one and the repealers thirty eight and both were in opposition to lord grey's government it was deemed wise in view of the crowd of inexperienced members to have an experienced speaker in the chair manners sutton was therefore re-elected though not without opposition from a handful of radicals and repealers led by coppet and o'connell despite the speaker's authority there was however much confusion at the beginning of the session for two nights and a half says crocker the vehemence and disorder was so great that people began to think the national convention was begun things gradually settled down 
but the outer aspect of the house corresponded to a real disintegration and confusion of parties the most remarkable feature of the new parliament was the way in which peel with amazing rapidity and dexterity re-established his personal position you will be placed in a new and i fear painful position in the house of commons so lord aberdeen had written to him on the eve of the session the prediction was entirely falsified by the event before the session was over peel was the real master of the house the fate of government was and he knew it in his hands crocker was right peel played his game with consummate adroitness despite their great majority the ministry was from the outset weak and rapidly grew weaker but peel kept them in for two reasons they were doing his work and there was no possible alternative what are we doing he wrote to crocker on march fifth eighteen thirty three at this moment we are making the reform bill work we are protecting the authors of the evil from the work of their own hands it was as we shall see no idle boast the king opened parliament in person on february fifth but his speech despite the solemnity and significance of that occasion was singularly colourless there was some reference to the affairs of portugal holland and belgium the parliament was reminded of its anxious duty to promote by all practicable means habits of industry and good order among the labouring classes of the community and of the expiration of the charters of the east india company and the bank of england but the bulk of the speech was devoted to ireland irish questions were indeed destined to dominate not only the speech but the session and the parliament before proceeding to discuss them it may be well to deal with other legislative achievements of the session the east india company had lost its commercial monopoly in india in eighteen thirteen and the opportunity was now taken for completing the work then begun the charter was renewed for another twenty years but only on condition that the company confined itself to the task of political administration the monopoly of the china trade was to be abandoned trading operations in india were to cease europeans were to be allowed to settle in india without hindrance and natives were to be admitted to office to compensate for the loss of its commercial privileges the company was to receive for forty years an annuity of six hundred and thirty thousand pounds charged upon the revenues of india a legal member was at the same time added by the appointment of macaulay to the governor-general's council the charter of the bank of england last renewed in eighteen hundred was to lapse in eighteen thirty three it was now renewed for a further term of twenty-one years but the conditions were considerably modified and parliament reserved to itself the right to revise them after eleven years despite strong opposition the bank of england was permitted to retain its most cherished privilege it remained the banker of the government it alone among the london joint stock banks was allowed to issue notes and these notes except at the bank of issue were to be legal tender the last provision was erroneously interpreted as a partial return to incontrovertibility as a fact it represented a concession to the country banks and an attempt to avoid a recurrence of the dangers more particularly the drain of gold revealed in eighteen twenty five through eighteen twenty six the convertibility of bank of england notes remained however entirely unimpaired two useful legal reforms stand to the credit of the lord chancellor one for the abolition of fines and recoveries greatly simplified the conveyance of land the second was an act for the better administration of justice in his majesty's privy council the long parliament in its zeal against the star chamber and other prerogative courts had swept away the greater part of the judicial business of the council 
but the latter still retained the supreme appellate jurisdiction for the oversea dominions of the crown the multiplication of colonies and dependencies restored to the council an importance of which the long parliament had never dreamt moreover in eighteen thirty two the high court of delegates established as the supreme court for ecclesiastical causes by henry the eighth was abolished and its jurisdiction was transferred to the privy council but the procedure of the latter was haphazard accordingly in eighteen thirty three its judicial functions were transformed to a committee consisting of the president of the council the lord chancellor and such privy councillors as held or had held high judicial office including in ecclesiastical cases such archbishops and bishops as were privy councillors the constitution of the court was further amended in eighteen seventy one and again in eighteen seventy six since eighteen thirty three its business has rapidly increased with the development of the oversea dominions and it now occupies a position of immense importance in the machinery of empire in ecclesiastical affairs its jurisdiction has not been unchallenged the first session of the first reformed parliament is memorable in the history of elementary education down to eighteen thirty three the whole responsibility for the education of the children of the poor had been assumed by the churches the church of england had done its work since eighteen eleven through the national society founded by andrew bell the british and foreign school society founded by joseph lancaster and maintained for the most part by the liberality of nonconformists had been in operation three years longer the budget of eighteen thirty three provided for a treasury grant of twenty thousand pounds a year in aid of elementary education by a treasury minute august thirtieth eighteen thirty three the administration of the money was entrusted to the two societies already named none of it was to be spent on the erection of schools and no grants were to be made unless they were met by at least an equal amount of voluntary contributions though not in itself imposing the grant laid the foundations of a gigantic edifice the treasury grant for education was not the only evidence of concern for the welfare of the rising generation of even greater immediate significance was the acceptance of lord altrip's factory bill during the last thirty years the conscience of the nation had been increasingly alive to the scandals connected with the employment of children in factories under the apprentice system parish apprentices were sent from the workhouses to the factories there to be used up as the cheapest raw material in the market the evils moral and sanitary connected with this white slavery compelled the intervention of the state thanks mainly to the efforts of the first sir robert peel the health and morals act was passed in eighteen o two the act laid down certain sanitary regulations and provided that the children should not be kept at work for more than twelve hours a day but it applied only to legal apprentices the result was to stimulate a traffic in some cases still more hideous because more unnatural between the mill owners and the parents instead of parish apprentices said sir robert peel the children of the surrounding poor are preferred whose masters being free from the operation of the former act of parliament are subjected to no limitation of time in the prosecution of their business though children are frequently admitted there to work thirteen or fourteen hours a day at the tender age of seven years and in some cases still younger parliament could not resist this demand for investigation especially when urged by such a representative cotton spinner as the first sir robert the commons appointed a committee in eighteen sixteen the lords in eighteen nineteen and as a result the second factory act eighteen nineteen was passed 
no children under nine years of age were to go into a factory for children under sixteen the hours were limited to twelve and night work was prohibited but the act referred only to cotton mills further restrictions were imposed by sir john hobhouse's act of eighteen twenty five which provided for definite meal times and a quarter holiday on saturdays the next stage was marked by the ten hours agitation initiated by richard ostler and michael thomas sadler sadler introduced but failed to pass a ten hours bill in eighteen thirty one at the general election of eighteen thirty two this eminent tory philanthropist was defeated at leeds and the parliamentary leadership of the movement was assumed by lord ashley better known later as the earl of shaftesbury ashley reintroduced the ten hours bill early in the first session of eighteen thirty three the government favoured counsels of delay but defeated in the house adopted ashley's bill and in a modified form passed it into law lord altrip's act as it is generally designated introduced several new principles into factory legislation a distinction was drawn between children aged nine to twelve and young persons thirteen to eighteen children were not to work more than nine hours a day or more than forty-eight a week and were to spend two hours a day in school the thin edge of the half-time wedge young persons were limited to a sixty-nine hours week and neither for them nor for children was night work permitted for the first time inspectors were appointed to see that the provisions of the act were enforced for a middle-class parliament this was not a bad beginning the cotton spinners did not like it but they were compelled to give way the benevolent interest of the new parliament was not confined to the white slaves at home of the rich legislative harvest gathered in this session the most memorable crop was the act for the abolition of slavery throughout the british colonies the question had long been kept before the mind and conscience of the country by a band of pure-hearted philanthropists such as clarkson william wilberforce zachary macaulay and foul buxton pitt and fox lent their powerful support in the house of commons and in eighteen o seven the traffic in slaves was legally prohibited in eighteen twenty three foul buxton introduced a motion in favour of the gradual abolition of slavery itself and canning in the same year issued a circular intended to secure the better treatment of slaves the immediate result of this movement was not favourable to discipline in the west indies the planters were infuriated and talked of independence the slaves became restless and unruly in eighteen thirty three the government grasping the nettle firmly decided on total emancipation all children under six years of age were to be freed immediately all who should hereafter be born were to be born into freedom slavery was to cease on august first eighteen thirty four and the slave owners were to be compensated by a loan of fifteen million pounds but between slavery and freedom there was to be an intermediate period of legal apprenticeship lasting for twelve years during this period the freed slaves were to work for their former masters during three-fourths of their working week or day in return for maintenance during one-fourth of their time they were to be free to work for hire this well-meant but complicated compromise did not stand before the bill passed the intermediate period was reduced from twelve years to seven and ultimately it lasted only four instead of a loan of fifteen million pounds the planters received an out-and-out -out compensation of twenty million pounds of the ultimate economic effects of emancipation this is not the place to write but it cannot be doubted that the free traders and abolitionists were over sanguine the act of eighteen thirty three was based primarily not on economic but on moral grounds 
at the cost of real self-sacrifice the nation deliberately determined on an act of righteousness and benevolence nor was the appropriate reward withheld end of section 10section eleven of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter six irish affairs o'connell and the whigs eighteen thirty three to eighteen thirty seven part one from the foregoing record of fruitful legislative activity it needs something of an effort to turn to the irish policy of the whig government but now and for many sessions to come ireland filled the stage at westminster and determined the fate of more than one ministry in eighteen thirty two the new electorate in ireland returned thirty-eight repealers and sixty-seven unionists but of the latter thirty seven favoured the extinction of tithes thus the country as an irish writer points out had declared strongly against the tithes and for the union the irish executive was committed by lord grey to lord anglesey as lord lieutenant and mr stanley as chief secretary during the critical years eighteen thirty to eighteen thirty three the latter was the virtual ruler of ireland stanley was a man of brilliant parts unsurpassed in debate a vigorous administrator clear-sighted within a limited range and transparently honest but he was absolutely devoid of that insight and imagination which are essential to a statesman who governs a dependency though thrice a conservative prime minister stanley was a typical whig he was a devout and unquestioning believer in the english system of government and firmly convinced that its adoption was alone sufficient to secure to all the various races of mankind social happiness and political contentment to ireland he offered this blessing in the exact spirit of cromwell's proclamation of sixteen forty nine we come by the assistance of god to hold forth and maintain the lustre of english liberty in a nation where we have an undoubted right to do it wherein the people of ireland if they listen not to such seducers as you are may equally participate in all benefits to use liberty and fortune equally with englishmen if they keep out of arms that any irishman should be blind to the lustre of english liberty or slow to avail himself of liberty and fortune in an english sense is what no genuine englishman has ever been able to understand and such lack of understanding is probably an important part of the equipment of a governing race stanley was typically devoid of it if the irish would keep out of arms and refuse to listen to seducers like o'connell all would be well after thirty years of stagnation in domestic politics the englishman was about to set his house in order if irishmen would behave nicely their house should be put in order too they too should have an extended franchise and municipal self-government a reformed poor law and a national system of education but the irony of the situation was that for whig reform of the english type extended to ireland with the best intentions the average irishman cared nothing during the decade that followed upon catholic emancipation interest in ireland was concentrated upon one question presenting itself under various aspects what was emancipation intended to mean did it mean merely the admission of a few catholic gentry to the parliament at westminster or the inauguration of a catholic administration in ireland would it secure the abolition of a system under which a literal tenth of the produce of all the poorest land in ireland 
went to the support of a wealthy, heretical, and alien church? What is the Irish question? asked Mr. Disraeli. One said it was a physical question, another a spiritual, now it was the absence of the aristocracy, then the absence of railways. It was the Pope one day, potatoes the next. During the early thirties, the answer to this question was unequivocal. The Irish question was tithes. To the Irish peasant, tithe was hateful on many grounds. It was an English institution, never having been known in Ireland until the Synod of Cashel in 1175. It was a badge of Protestant descendancy, never having been exacted until the Reformation, and it was a perpetually recurrent drain upon his scanty material resources. Thus the injury was partly material and partly moral. Tithe was at once a drain upon his purse, a seer upon his conscience. No such argument availed for the Episcopalian farmer. But the Protestants, Episcopalian and Presbyterian alike, had managed in large extent to evade the impost. Tithe was, of course, only part of a larger question. The position of the established church in Ireland was entirely anomalous. It was magnificently endowed. To put its revenues at £800,000 a year would probably be an understatement. Yet despite its endowments and despite the penal legislation of the 18th century, its adherents were proportionately fewer than they had been two centuries before. In 1834, the population of Ireland was close to 8 million. Of these, 6,427,712 persons were Roman Catholics. 852,064 were Protestant Episcopalians. 642,356 were Presbyterians, while 21,808 adhered to other forms of Protestant descent. The Church of the 800,000 Protestant Episcopalians was established and endowed. The Church of the 600,000 Presbyterians was endowed, but not established. The Church of the 6 million Catholics was neither established nor endowed. On an Irish Sabbath morning, says Sidney Smith, the bell of a neat parish church often summons to worship only the parson and an occasionally conforming clerk, while two hundred yards off a thousand Catholics are huddled together in a miserable hovel and pelted by all the storms of heaven. The immediate object of the Catholic peasant, however, was to get rid of the payment of the tithe. In 1830, war was proclaimed. Let your hatred of tithe be as lasting as your love of justice. Such was the advice of the Catholic Bishop of Kildare, Dr. Doyle. Advice of this kind rarely falls upon deaf ears in Ireland. The fuel was already gathered. It needed but a spark to ignite it. By 1831, all Ireland was ablaze. Payment of tithes, says a contemporary account, was almost everywhere refused. The usual system of threats and murder was again set in motion. The clergyman dared not ask. The willing occupier dared not pay. At the end of 1831, committees were appointed in both houses to investigate the question. The committees recommended, number one, an immediate grant by government to the distressed clergy, and number two, a scheme for the extinction of tithes and their commutation for a charge upon land. On these lines, Lord Grey's government legislated in 1832. An act was passed authorizing the government to advance a sum not exceeding £60,000 to the Irish clergy and to reimburse themselves by collecting the arrears from the tithe payers. Later in the year, Stanley obtained the sanction of Parliament to a second measure, making tithe composition compulsory and permanent. Both measures were violently opposed by O'Connell. 
the first he declared would make the lord lieutenant tithe proctor general for all ireland the second would only perpetuate abuses while both would serve to buttress an institution which was hopelessly rotten and unsound meanwhile the social condition of ireland was going from bad to worse the legislation of eighteen thirty two had served only to accentuate bad feeling no tithes could be collected a widespread system of boycotting was initiated the executive was powerless and by the end of the year anarchy was everywhere triumphant such were the circumstances under which the general election of eighteen thirty two was held o'connell definitely unfurled the banner of repeal and ireland returned forty-five members pledged to sustain him in his demands the king's speech of eighteen thirty three after foreshadowing a tithe commutation bill and a bill dealing with the protestant establishment proceeded but it is my painful duty to observe that the disturbances in ireland to which i adverted at the close of the last session have greatly increased the spirit of insubordination and violence has risen to the most fearful height rendering life and property insecure defying the authority of the law and threatening the most fatal consequences if not promptly and effectually repressed the debate on the address was bitter and protracted that crime was rife in ireland o'connell did not deny but crime was due not to agitation but to misgovernment o'connell was answered by stanley and the answer of stanley may be compressed into a sentence a government to be loved must first be feared reform come coercion and undying resistance to repeal this was the programme of the ministry on february twelfth lord altrip introduced into the house of commons a bill dealing with the temporalities of the church in ireland it was a large measure involving as originally drafted a considerable dose of disendowment opinion however was not ripe for the acceptance of the principle of appropriation and this part of the bill was subsequently dropped the remainder of it after a stormy passage became law two archbishoprics and eight bishoprics were suppressed first fruits and church cess were discontinued many sinecures were abolished some ecclesiastical incomes were reduced and a commission to deal with the surplus revenues of the church was appointed but on the main question victory rested with the ascendancy party revenues were to be redistributed but not alienated on february fifteenth a coercion bill was introduced by lord grey into the house of lords it was admittedly of the severest character greville describes it as a consomme of insurrection gagging acts suspension of habeas corpus martial law and one or two other little hards and sharps immense powers were committed to the lord lieutenant and ireland was to be temporarily governed by martial law the debate in the commons revealed the fact that the ministry was divided as to the expediency of the measure altrip's speech in introducing it was singularly ineffective but stanley in a great speech saved the bill despite the opposition of repealers and radicals the bill became law in april the session however sorely tried the cohesion of the government and before its close the ministry was reconstructed lord wellesley succeeded lord anglesey as lord lieutenant while stanley was replaced as chief secretary first by hobhouse and afterwards by littleton footnote lord wellesley's son-in-law and footnote but stanley's promotion to the colonial office involved no change in the irish policy of the administration in opening the session of eighteen thirty four the king was able to congratulate parliament upon a great improvement in the state of ireland that his words were not merely due to official optimism is proved alike by the private correspondence of the time and by the public statistics of ireland crime and outrage had undoubtedly diminished the castle had regained the upper hand 
but the causes of social disorder remained against the union and against tithes the agitation was waged without remission the king's speech referred to both questions it announced such a final adjustment of the tithes as may extinguish all just causes of complaint without injury to any institution in church or state at the same time it declared his majesty's unalterable resolution to maintain inviolate by all the means in his power the legislative union the action of the ministry was unequal in resolution and consistency to the words of the king there was indeed no faltering with the question of the union on april twenty second o'connell moved for a select committee to inquire and report on the means by which the dissolution of the parliament of ireland was effected on the effects of that measure upon ireland and on the probable consequences of continuing the legislative union between both countries the motion was defeated by a majority of five hundred and twenty three to thirty eight in regard to the church problem the ministry was less fortunate the tithe question was still far from settlement and behind the tithe question loomed the whole question of the irish establishment late in eighteen thirty three littleton had induced parliament to vote one million pounds to the distressed tithe owners and to authorize the government to collect the arrears early in eighteen thirty four a bill was introduced for the commutation of tithes into a land tax payable to the state at the rate of eighty per cent of their previous value in the course of the debate ministers were challenged on the larger question of appropriation the challenge was variously answered by stanley and lord john russell the dissension of the cabinet stood revealed to the world johnny in more senses than one had indeed upset the coach the government agreed to the appointment of a commission to inquire into the whole question of the position of the irish church on this stanley resigned sir james graham the duke of richmond and the earl of ripon formerly lord goderich went with him the cabinet was temporarily patched up but their troubles were by no means at an end hopelessly divided on the principle of appropriation they were still more divided on that of coercion stanley's act of eighteen thirty three was to expire on august first some members of the cabinet were opposed to its renewal at any rate in its entirety lord wellesley was prepared to rule without it littleton undertook to manage dan his management however was so clumsy as to bring the whole government down like a pack of cards the cabinet insisted on the renewal of the coercion act o'connell declared that he had been tricked by littleton littleton was obliged to resign altrip followed lord grey refused to go on without altrip and on july ninth his own resignation was announced the reform ministry was at an end the great ship had gone to pieces on the irish rocks the immediate cause of the disaster was clearly the indiscretion of littleton but the essential causes went much deeper the ministry as a whole had no clear mind on the irish question and in policy they were divided for the actual course of administration stanley whether at the castle or at the colonial office was primarily responsible with the best intentions in the world stanley cannot be described as a sympathetic administrator and he was cordially disliked by the irish members but whatever his shortcomings stanley knew his own mind he cannot be blamed for not knowing the minds of littleton wellesley altrip and lord john this double-mindedness was fatal to the ministry of lord grey and their failure in ireland was neither unaccountable nor undeserved to the general record of failure there was however one exception stanley must have full credit for having done more than any other individual to lay the foundations of a national system of education 
his bill was based upon the principle of a combined literary and a separate religious education a board was to be constituted by the lord lieutenant composed partly of protestants and partly of catholics the board was to appoint teachers authorize school books and to superintend the whole system of national elementary education even the suspicion of proselytism was to be banished four days a week were to be devoted to combined moral and literary one or two to separate religious instruction finally the parliamentary grant was to be withdrawn from the kildare street society and bestowed upon the national board stanley's act has been the basis of elementary education in ireland from that day to this though the whole spirit of its administration has been altered stanley contemplated a mixed system to this idea the whole genius of the irish people roman catholics and protestants is irresistibly opposed and in this case the national genius has proved itself too strong for legislative intention and enactment throughout the length and breadth of ireland with very small exceptions the school system is to-day not mixed but strictly denominational during the last months of lord grey's ministry ireland claimed a large but not an exclusive share of public attention apart from ireland the session of eighteen thirty four was memorable on the one hand for a great legislative achievement and on the other for the evidence it afforded as to the existence of a new force in english politics with the former we shall deal presently as to the latter a word must be said at once the legislation of eighteen thirty two even more conspicuously than that of eighteen twenty eight footnote repeal of the test and corporation acts and footnote made the protestant dissenter a really effective political force it was clearly manifested in the new parliament already in eighteen thirty three the house of commons had permitted mr pease the first quaker elected for one hundred and forty years to take his seat on making an affirmation in the same session an act was passed to enable quakers moravians and separatists on all occasions to substitute an affirmation for an oath in eighteen thirty four the dissenters petitioned for the exclusion of the bishops from the house of lords and indeed for the complete separation of church and state a bill for the admission of dissenters to university degrees passed the commons but was rejected in the lords other bills for the relief of dissenters from church rates for the removal of restrictions upon the celebration of marriages in dissenting chapels and for the commutation of english tithes did not get so far few legislative achievements have had a more significant bearing upon the social and moral life of the people than the poor law amendment act of eighteen thirty four for this legislation the whig ministers are entitled to unstinted credit no government seeking only popularity would have touched the question no government genuinely concerned for the social and economic welfare of the people could have evaded it the great poor law of elizabeth had conferred upon the indigent poor two rights upon the impotent the right to maintenance upon the lusty and able-bodied the right to be set on work appropriate to an era of paternal despotism and economic transition the act might have wrought much mischief but for the wisdom of administrators an amendment of seventeen twenty two imposed a salutary restraint upon careless methods of relief and virtually insisted upon the workhouse test the last years of the eighteenth century witnessed a lamentable lapse from sound principles the administrators of that day were not however without excuse it was a time of economic transition of high political excitement and of terrible suffering among the poorest class but the remedies applied proved even worse than the disease they led to the wholesale 
pauperization of the rural laborers. Gilbert's Act of 1782 effected the first breach in good administration. Though permissive in terms, it was widely adopted, and its principles were still further enforced and rendered compulsory by the Act of 36 George the Third, 1796. The workhouse test was abolished, work was found for the workless, and allowances were made in aid of wages. Lax administration was even more responsible than panic legislation for the wholesale demoralization which ensued. It guaranteed to every laborer not merely his life, but a living more plentiful than he could obtain in the open labor market. It undertook that his means should increase with the increase of his family. It acknowledged the duty of saving him from suffering, irrespective of his own merits or demerits. It gave practically to everybody who asked. It charged not only the weak upon the strong, but the stupid on the skillful, the lazy upon the industrious, the drunken upon the sober, the dissolute upon the chaste, the honest upon the dishonest. This terrible impeachment can be proved to the hilt from the report of the commission appointed by Lord Grey's government in 1832. The commissioners, including such men as Dr. Blumfield, Bishop of London, Dr. Sumner, Bishop of Chester, Nassau Sr., Sturges Bourne, and Edward Chadwick, arrived at conclusions which can only be described as appalling. Economic dislocation and social degradation went hand in hand. Expenditure, which in 1701 amounted to about £900,000, rose in 1802 to over four million pounds, and ultimately, in 1818, reached the gigantic total of seven million eight hundred and seventy thousand pounds, or thirteen shillings four pence per head of population. Outdoor relief was given in a bewildering variety of forms, by providing gratuitous house room, by money relief in lieu of labor, by parish employment, by the roundsman system, by the labor rate system, and most commonly of all by make-up or bread money, by an allowance, that is, in aid of wages. In some parishes the poor rate exceeded twenty shillings in the pound. Farms were thrown up, land went out of cultivation, landlords, farmers, and laborers were involved in a common ruin. The wrong inflicted upon the laborers who remained self-supporting and independent was incalculable. The debasement of the rest was matched only by their discontent. Legislation followed immediately upon the report of the commissioners, and neither came a moment too soon. The assent given to the Bill of 1834 was almost unanimous. Only twenty votes were recorded against the second reading in the Commons, and thirteen in the Lords. The general principle of the Act was that the situation of the person receiving relief should not on the whole be made really or apparently so eligible as the situation of the independent laborer of the lowest class. The control of poor relief was vested in a board of three commissioners upon whom immense discretionary powers were conferred. They were to have power to order the erection of workhouses, the formation of unions of parishes, and the drafting of regulations for outdoor relief. In each union, the law was to be administered by a board of guardians, consisting in part of members elected by the ratepayers, and in part by the justices of the peace. The law of settlement was relaxed, and the bastardy law amended. The core of the act was the appointment of poor law commissioners. The first commissioners were the Right Honorable Franklin Lewis, Mr. Nichols, and Mr. Shaw Lefebvre, and it was these men who, together with their secretary, Mr. Edwin Chadwick, gave the color to the Act of 1834. The Act itself was hardly more than a cadre. Everything depended on the discretion of the board. For the success or failure of the Act, 
the commissioners and their secretary, not the legislature, were responsible. They saved England from the gravest social and economic danger to which it had ever been exposed. Their work, in particular the abolition of outdoor relief for the able-bodied and the reimposition of the workhouse test, was subjected to severe criticism. They themselves were denounced as the Bashaws of Somerset House, as concentrated icicles. Tory Democrats, like Disraeli, combined with radicals like Cobbett and the all-powerful Times to assail the poor law Bastilles and to abuse the poor man's robbery bill. The remedies applied were indubitably caustic, but not more caustic than the gravity and prevalence of the disease demanded. No rosewater surgery, to use Carlyle's phrase, could have sufficed financial ruin and moral degradation had stared us in the face. To have saved rural England from bankruptcy was much. It was still more to have restored to the English poor their moral dignity and economic independence. End of section 11. Section 12 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Irish Affairs O'Connell and the Whigs, 1833 to 1837, Part 2. The Poor Law Amendment Bill was proposed by Lord Grey's Ministry. Before it became law, Lord Grey had resigned, and Lord Melbourne had become Prime Minister. But the life of the new ministry was from the first precarious. Such strength as it possessed was due mainly to Lord Altrip's personal hold upon the House of Commons. By what was virtually a party plebiscite, Lord Altrip was induced to return to the Cabinet in the lead of the House. The Derby Dilly, with its three insides, remained in opposition coalition with peel and wellington though suggested by the king was wisely declined on both sides lord melbourne therefore retained most of the colleagues of lord grey weak in parliament the new ministry was not in favour at court the king never gave it his confidence and took the first opportunity of dispensing with its services the opportunity came in november of eighteen thirty four with Lord Altrip's succession to the peerage. A new leader had to be found for the Commons. Lord John Russell was proposed, but the King told Melbourne that Russell would make a wretched figure, and that Abercrombie and Rice were worse than Russell. On November 15th, the town was electrified by the news that Melbourne's government was at an end. The mystery, which for a long time enshrouded the circumstances attending Lord Melbourne's dismissal, has not even now been entirely dissipated. It is long since a government has been so summarily dismissed, regularly kicked out, in the simplest sense of that phrase. Such was Greville's first impression, and it has been very generally accepted. But it has now become clear that Melbourne himself felt that the main prop of the government was removed by Altrip's succession to the peerage that he intimated to the king the probability of a break-up of the cabinet on the irish church question and that he was personally glad to be out of it palmerston's account of the matter is entirely corroborative we are turned out turned out neck and crop melbourne wrote to the king to say that as when he first took his present office he had represented the influence of Altrip in the Commons as one great foundation of the strength of the government. Now that Altrip was removed to the Lords by the death of his father, he deemed it his duty toward the King to ask whether he wished him to propose arrangements for supplying Altrip's place, or whether he preferred asking advice from other quarters. One of Lord Melbourne's biographers goes so far as to say that the King did what his minister invited him to do. Be this as it may, two things are certain, that the king was anxious to be rid of his ministers, chiefly from apprehensions as to their church policy, 
and that the prime minister was not sorry to be free of the troubles which he saw immediately ahead of him lord melbourne himself bore the king's summons to the duke of wellington the duke advised his majesty to entrust the formation of a ministry to peel but peel was at the moment in rome and in the meantime the duke became secretary of state for all departments the great seal was transferred to lyndhurst but for some weeks the duke was literally sole minister on december ninth peel having travelled post haste from rome kissed hands as first lord of the treasury negotiations were opened with stanley graham and other seceders from the late cabinet but by preconcerted arrangement the latter declined them peel therefore had to rely entirely upon conservatives he himself took the chancellorship of the exchequer the duke took the foreign office gulburn the home office and lord aberdeen war in the colonies lyndhurst again became lord chancellor peel decided not to meet parliament but to appeal to the electorate and on december thirtieth parliament was dissolved the election that ensued is remarkable chiefly for the address issued by the prime minister to the electors of tamworth that manifesto marked an epoch in the history of english parties it laid the foundations of the new conservatism in it peel definitely accepted the reform bill as a final and irrevocable settlement of a great constitutional question nor was he opposed to the spirit of the act if properly understood and wisely interpreted if by adopting the spirit of the reform bill it is meant that we are to live in a perpetual vortex of agitation that public men can only support themselves in public estimation by adopting every popular impression of the day by promising the instant redress of anything that anybody may call an abuse i will not undertake to adopt it but if the spirit of the reform bill implies merely a careful review of institutions civil and ecclesiastical undertaken in a friendly temper combining with the firm maintenance of established rights the correction of proved abuses and the redress of real grievances in that case i can for myself and my colleagues undertake to act in such a spirit and with such intentions the education of the country to the new conservatism was however a work of time the general election of eighteen thirty five raised the strength of the conservatives from one hundred and fifty to two hundred and seventy but not until eighteen forty one did they find themselves in a clear majority the new parliament met in temporary quarters at westminster both houses having been destroyed by fire during the recess the opposition carried an amendment of the address but only by a majority of seven and peel decided that he would carry on the government until easter but whatever government was in office ireland and particularly the tithe question demanded immediate attention sir henry harding peel's chief secretary brought forward a measure which was a simplified edition of littleton's bill of eighteen thirty four the urgency and magnitude of the evil render it said the chief secretary absolutely necessary that parliament should attempt to rescue society in ireland from the disorganized state into which it has been thrown by the tithe question intimidation has been carried to such an extent as to render it utterly impossible to proceed with the collection of these dues the whigs however were determined not to allow the tories to legislate on the tithe question without concurrently affirming the principle of appropriation the whole question was formally raised by russell on the clear issue thus joined the ministry was decisively defeated and on april eighth peel resigned melbourne came back to office but for the next five years o'connell was in power melbourne's second ministry did not differ widely in personnel from his first lord palmerston returned to the foreign office charles grant afterwards lord glenelg became colonial secretary and lord john russell with the lead of the commons went to the home office spring rice became chancellor of the exchequer and lord lansdowne resumed the presidency of the council one significant change was made 
broom whose restless vanity had contributed not a little to the fall of the government in the previous autumn was not invited to return to the woolsack and until january eighteen thirty six the great seal was in commission lord cottenham pepys was then appointed the session of eighteen thirty five witnessed the enactment of one measure of first-rate importance for the last three centuries the government of english towns had been growing more and more oligarchical and more and more corrupt vested from early times in the general body of rate-paying burgesses town government gradually passed into the hands of a corporation consisting generally of a mayor aldermen and common councillors these governing bodies were as a rule self-elected and their importance was enhanced by the fact that in them was vested in many cases the right of returning members to parliament the creation of new boroughs by the tudors and stuarts led to a great increase in the number of these close corporations charles the second and james the second made a determined effort to bring all the corporations under the direct influence of the crown the effort was attended by very partial success and was one of the contributory causes of the revolution of sixteen eighty eight but the abuses connected with municipal government were intensified rather than diminished during the eighteenth century the rapid increase of many towns in wealth and population the enhanced significance of parliamentary representation gave to the oligarchical corporations an additional importance a place on these exclusive bodies was eagerly sought for the pecuniary advantages it conferred the report of a commission appointed in eighteen thirty three revealed a scandalous condition of affairs local administration as now understood was the last thing with which the governing bodies concerned themselves many of the corporations possessed considerable corporate property derived from land lease of tithes tolls of markets and fairs octroi duties and fees in many they administered specific trusts in all they exercised valuable patronage it is hardly too much to say that it was the prevailing rule that all the property and most patronage was administered with a single eye to the advantage of the administrators the revenues of the corporation are variously employed a great part is usually absorbed in the salaries of their officers and entertainments of the common council and their friends it is not often that much of the corporate property is expended on police or public improvements in some towns large sums have been spent in bribery and other illegal practices of contested elections during the election of eighteen twenty six the corporation of leicester expended ten thousand pounds to secure the success of a political partisan and mortgaged some of their property to discharge the liability incurred few corporations admit any positive obligation to spend the surplus of their income for objects of public advantage at cambridge the practice of turning the corporation property to the profit of individuals was avowed and defended it is small wonder that the commissioners found it necessary to report that the existing municipalities neither possess nor deserve the confidence or respect of his majesty's subjects and that there prevailed a distrust of the self-elected municipal councils whose powers are subject to no popular control any discontent under the burdens of local taxation while revenues that ought to be applied for public advantage are diverted from their legitimate use and are sometimes wastefully bestowed for the benefit of individuals sometimes squandered for purposes injurious to the character and morals of the people the provisions of the act of eighteen thirty five were of a drastic character the constitutions of nearly all the old corporate boroughs one hundred and seventy eight in number except london were remodelled on a uniform plan the government was vested in a mayor aldermen and councillors the latter to be elected by all inhabitant householders who for the past three years had been raided to the relief of the poor to the corporation was entrusted all the ordinary duties of local administration and in particular the raising and expenditure of borough funds these funds were to be subject to independent audit 
the corporations had already lost by the act of eighteen thirty two their exclusive privilege in regard to parliamentary elections and the act of eighteen thirty five was a natural corollary of that great measure inspired by a similar spirit it achieved similar results it registered the first and therefore the most important step in the democratization of local government in england an irish municipal bill was introduced in eighteen thirty six and again in eighteen thirty seven on both occasions it passed through the house of commons but was defeated in the lords not until eighteen forty did it become law under its provisions fifty-eight corporations were abolished and ten were reconstituted on the basis of a ten-pound franchise the same franchise had been adopted in the scotch act of eighteen thirty three apart from municipal reform the legislative energies of the second melbourne ministry were almost entirely concentrated upon ireland early in eighteen thirty five o'connell defined the terms on which he was prepared to keep the whigs in office the question of repeal would be allowed to remain in abeyance provided that the whigs would press to a successful issue three measures the appropriation of the surplus revenues of the irish church to national purposes an extension of the irish suffrage and a sweeping reform of the irish corporations these terms formed the basis of the lichfield house compact compact says russell there was none but an alliance on honourable terms of mutual cooperation undoubtedly existed the whigs remained as before the firm defenders of the union o'connell remained as before the ardent advocate of repeal but upon intermediate measures on which the two parties could agree consistently with their principles there was no want of cordiality nor did i ever see cause to complain of o'connell's conduct the more straightforward course would have been to give o'connell the office he undoubtedly desired broom it is certain urged this course upon the ministers equally certain is it that whether melbourne himself was prepared for it or not the king's hostility to his admission was immovable under a keen sense of disappointment o'connell behaved as greville put it admirably well it is intended he writes to leave o'connell out of the arrangement and at the same time to conciliate him and preserve his support in this they the ministers have succeeded o'connell had his consolations he missed indeed the opportunity for which he is said to have longed the opportunity of proving to the protestants of ireland that when in power he could and would do them justice but at any rate he could secure his co-religionists from injustice if he was not himself in office he had approved those who were lord mulgrave became lord lieutenant lord morpeth chief secretary the law offices were placed in sympathetic hands but the man who gave the tone to the melbourne o'connell administration was the under secretary thomas drummond whatever the verdict on his policy may ultimately be drummond himself was by general admission one of the most striking figures in the history of british rule in ireland the difficulties confronting drummond in ireland were not slight throughout the country and among all classes the spirit of lawlessness was dominant the tithe war was being waged with undiminished bitterness faction fights were common disorder was rife justice was condemned and the whole administrative system was utterly demoralized drummond's first work was to establish confidence in the administration of justice and inspire respect for law extraordinary powers he disliked and disclaimed coercion he believed to be demoralizing alike to the subject and to ruler but implicit obedience to the ordinary law he was determined as far as in him lay to exact and from all parties that drummond was entirely successful in the restoration of social order in ireland cannot be asserted he did all perhaps that even-handed administration could effect but he was not master of the legislative machine at westminster 
nor could he by a stroke of the pen work a revolution in the economic conditions of the people whom he ruled all that man could do he did he urged upon his superiors the pressing need of agrarian legislation and he worked with superhuman energy to develop the industrial resources of the country in popular imagination drummond lives as the author of the famous aphorism now happily a commonplace property has its duties as well as its rights a reminder originally addressed to the magistrates of tipperary but his rule was brief worn out with labours physical and mental thomas drummond died in eighteen forty to say that he made mistakes is merely to affirm that he was human overhaste is the common fault of the idealist idealist and over hasty drummond was nevertheless his rule is a bright chapter in the sombre volume of irish history while drummond was toiling in dublin the melbourne government was industriously occupied in ploughing the sands at westminster the situation was no doubt difficult for the ministers and especially for lord john russell they had come into power on the principle of appropriation footnote that is the appropriation of the surplus revenue of the irish established church in ireland to secular purposes and footnote o'connell who kept them in power had declared that that one word was worth the whole bill to drop appropriation would have been hardly decent to carry it through the house of commons was difficult to carry it through the house of lords was soon found to be impossible bill after bill was rejected in the latter house ministers might storm the peers smiled they were in an impregnable position for behind them was the solid body of english opinion the whigs depended upon o'connell the conservatives relied upon england under these circumstances to fill up the cup is only to drink to political disaster apart from appropriation more pith might have carried a satisfactory tithe bill in eighteen thirty five all parties had assented to the principles the burden was to be transferred in appearance at any rate from occupier to owner the clergy were to lose some portion of their money but to gain in security not however until eighteen thirty eight were these principles actually embodied in legislation in that year ministers decided on a frank abandonment of appropriation and the house of lords whose victory if temporary was complete passed the bill tithes were henceforth commuted into a permanent rent charge at the rate of seventy five per cent of their nominal value and the large advances made to the clergy in lieu of arrears amounting in all to a million of money were wiped out the act was virtually identical with harding's bill of eighteen thirty five and its passing constituted a humiliating defeat for its authors and a triumph for their opponents the same session witnessed the passing of an irish poor law in ireland as in most roman catholic countries there had been hitherto no legal provision for the relief of the poor but about eighteen thirty the terrible distress existing among the irish peasantry attracted the attention of the imperial parliament various schemes for the amelioration of their lot were proposed and in eighteen thirty three a commission was appointed to inquire into the whole subject language is too weak to describe the appalling state of things which their report revealed the root of the difficulty was the same as that which confronts us in india today. population had multiplied with astonishing rapidity comparatively good government had removed the natural check while the stimulus had been supplied by priests and landlords in three quarters of a century the population of ireland had nearly trebled for six months out of the twelve one-third of this population or two million three hundred eighty five thousand people were on the verge of starvation something had to be done but what the commissioners recommended a variety of palliatives emigration public works model agricultural schools reclamation of waste bogs and the like but they shrank and herein they were thoroughly representative of irish opinion from a poor law on the english lines 
the government regarded the report as inconclusive and the recommendations as inadequate they therefore sent over to ireland mr nichols an english poor law commissioner to make further inquiries in six weeks he had presented his report and on that report the government framed their bill the whole country was to be divided into unions each union was to be administered by a board of guardians consisting in part of ex officio in part of elected members for these boards no minister of religion was to be eligible there was to be no law of settlement workhouses were to be erected the workhouse test was to be absolute there was to be no outdoor relief indoor relief was to be given only to the destitute the irish act was the english act of eighteen thirty four stripped of the settlement principle and of outdoor relief for four years it was administered by english officials the act was amended in eighteen forty three and again in eighteen forty seven mainly in an english direction it has never been popular in ireland but on the whole it has achieved a fair measure of success the contents of this chapter afford sufficient evidence that during the first decade of whig rule ireland was seldom far from the surface of english politics but before the irish poor law bill and the tithes commutation bill became law an event of first-rate importance occurred in england on june twentieth eighteen thirty seven william the fourth died the crown of hanover devolved upon his brother the duke of cumberland and that of great britain and ireland upon his young niece princess victoria end of section twelve section thirteen of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter seven the first years of the new reign eighteen thirty seven to eighteen forty one part one the young princess who was now called to ascend the throne was the only child of her parents her father was edward duke of kent seventeen sixty seven to eighteen twenty the fourth son of george the third her mother was victoria mary louisa seventeen eighty six to eighteen sixty one daughter of francis duke of saxe coburg salfeld and widow of the prince of leiningen by whom she had a son and a daughter the duke of kent was a man of considerable ability and high character a keen soldier and unlike his father and brothers a robust liberal he was genuinely interested in the movement for the abolition of slavery was zealous for popular education and voted for catholic emancipation he died at a comparatively early age just before his father in eighteen twenty leaving his widow and infant child in circumstances which were almost straitened the duchess of kent was a woman of strong not to say stern character and brought up her daughter both strictly and well from her earliest years the young princess was trained in habits of order punctuality obedience and self-sacrifice her education was undertaken largely by the duchess herself assisted by miss Leitzen, the rev george davies and a large staff of masters for special subjects her political education up to her accession to the throne she owed mainly to her maternal uncle prince leopold of saxe coburg who but for the untimely and lamentable death of the princess charlotte would himself have been prince consort of england footnote king of the belgians eighteen thirty one and footnote but though docile and considerate the princess from her early years instinctively formed an independent judgment on any question that concerned her prince leopold she regarded as a second father and the long series of letters which passed between them proves how well her confidence and affection were justified in eighteen twenty seven the death of the duke of york rendered the ultimate succession of the princess almost certain 
on the accession of the Duke of Clarence in 1830, she became heir presumptive, and in recognition of this fact, Parliament voted to the Duchess of Kent an extra £10,000 a year. Seven years later, the death of William IV brought the Princess Victoria to the throne. Just 18 at the time of her accession, Queen Victoria was confronted with a difficult, not to say a perilous, situation. Canada was in rebellion, and the language of contemporaries proves that they regarded its separation from Great Britain as a contingency by no means remote. Ireland was not far removed from the state of Canada, while in England the Chartist agitation was just coming to a head. Worst of all, the position of the monarchy was far from secure. Under George III, the throne was popular but not respected. Under George IV, it was neither. William IV restored its popularity but not its dignity. It was therefore the first task of Queen Victoria to re-establish the monarchy in the affections and respect of her people in general, and in particular to conciliate the support of the middle classes, who since 1832 had become the dominant power in the state. Consequently, it was supremely fortunate that the Queen, by a providential gift of temperament, thoroughly understood the middle class point of view, a fact demonstrated in a thousand ways during the next half century. The young queen was fortunate in the personality of her first minister. Lord Melbourne cannot be counted among the greatest of English statesmen, but he has one supreme title to our gratitude. He guided Queen Victoria wisely, gently, and firmly in the paths of constitutional monarchy. The queen was an apt pupil, but from the first hour of her reign the force of her own personality was apparent in all she did. Her journal of June 20th, 1837, reads thus. At nine came Lord Melbourne, whom I saw in my room, and of course quite alone, as I shall always do all my ministers. He kissed my hand, and I then acquainted him that it had long been my intention to retain him and the rest of the present ministry at the head of affairs, and that it could not be in better hands than his. I like him very much and feel confidence in him. He is a very straightforward, honest, clever, and good man. How fortunate I am, she wrote to King Leopold, to have at the head of my government a man like Lord Melbourne. He is of the greatest use to me politically and privately. The young queen had need of all the help and encouragement which Melbourne could give her. His own position, however, was far from assured. In the general election which ensued, the Conservatives still further improved their position, numbering 312 as against 273 in the previous Parliament. England and Wales gave them a clear majority of 20 against the ministers, but Scotland and Ireland redressed the balance. Even with Radicals and O'Connellites, however, the ministerialists could claim only a majority of 34. A short autumn session was devoted to the settlement of the new civil list. The result is of historic significance as marking the climax of that gradual change which had been in progress since the Revolution. Down to that time there had been no discrimination between the revenue of the crown and that of the nation. The institution of the civil list under William III was the first attempt to clear up the confusion. The process then begun was carried further under his successors. The total sum voted to the crown was gradually diminished, but with each diminution the crown was relieved of charges which belonged more properly to Parliament. George II received the hereditary revenues with a parliamentary guarantee that if they fell short of £800,000 a year, the deficiency would be made good by Parliament. George III placed the hereditary revenues for the first time at the disposal of Parliament, and accepted in return the minimum civil list of his predecessor of £800,000 a year. William IV, on his accession, surrendered to Parliament 
not only the hereditary revenues but also certain miscellaneous and casual sources of revenue in return he received a civil list of five hundred and ten thousand pounds a year divided into five departments to each of which a specific annual sum was assigned at the same time the civil list was further relieved of various extraneous charges the process was completed on the accession of queen victoria the civil list was then fixed at three hundred and eighty five thousand pounds a year distributed as follows number one privy purse sixty thousand pounds number two household salaries etc one hundred and thirty one thousand two hundred and sixty pounds number three royal journeys etc one hundred and seventy two thousand five hundred pounds number four royal bounty thirteen thousand two hundred pounds number five unappropriated eight thousand forty pounds the crown still continued to enjoy the revenues of the duchies of lancaster and cornwall the latter being part of the appanage of the prince of wales all other hereditary revenues were surrendered by the queen to the nation and the nation made an exceedingly good bargain in eighteen thirty seven the hereditary revenues amounted to less than two hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year in nineteen hundred they were worth four hundred and fifty two thousand pounds a year more than sufficient to pay the whole civil list but the arrangement was in reality no less advantageous to the crown than to the nation the sum voted to the queen proved indeed in the later years of the reign inadequate to the maintenance of the royal state but the crown had its reward increase in national expenditure could no longer be ascribed either to the extravagance of the court or to its desire to exercise illicit political influence after the settlement of the civil list parliament was adjourned until february but grave news from canada led to its reassembling on january sixteenth for some time past the condition of canada had given rise to considerable anxiety many causes combined to excite discontent more particularly in lower or french canada but foremost among them was the constitutional difficulty to understand this a brief retrospect is necessary the canada which passed under the dominion of great britain in seventeen sixty three was french twenty years later there was superadded a british canada due largely to the immigration of the united empire loyalists the expelled tories from the colonies which had cast off the british connection and become the united states between french and english roman catholics and protestants friction before long arose this pitt attempted to assuage in his canada constitutional act of seventeen ninety one and for the time being with success under this act canada was divided into two colonies upper and lower ottawa and quebec in each there was to be a governor assisted by an executive council and a bicameral legislature a council of nominees and an elected house of representatives in each land was set apart for the endowment of the dominant church for a time things went well and in the war of eighteen twelve the canadians demonstrated their loyalty to great britain as they had in the war of american independence but the constitution of seventeen ninety one had one crucial defect the executive was in no way responsible to the legislature this defect combined with fiscal and ecclesiastical difficulties ultimately led to the breakdown of the constitution in lower canada in particular there was a prolonged conflict between the assembly and the executive having no influence in the choice of any public functionary no power to procure the removal of such as were obnoxious to it on merely political grounds and seeing almost every office in the colony filled by persons in whom it had no confidence the assembly had recourse to that ultima ratio of representative power to which the more prudent forbearance of the crown has never driven the house of commons in england and endeavoured to disable the whole machinery of government 
by a general refusal of the supplies. In Upper Canada, the same root difficulty existed, but not being complicated by racial differences, it presented itself in a less accentuated form. Led by a young Frenchman, Louis J. Papineau, a vain and self-seeking rhetorician, the French party in Lower Canada raised the standard of independence, 1837. A party in Upper Canada, led by William Lyon Mackenzie, followed suit. In both colonies the rebellion was ultimately suppressed without difficulty, but not before it had compelled the attention of the home government to the menacing condition of affairs in British North America. Hitherto the English ministry had been disposed to minimize its significance. Early in 1838, however, they decided to suspend the Canadian Constitution and to send out Lord Durham as High Commissioner. From a personal point of view, Durham's mission to Canada was a fiasco, but the report in which he embodied his views of the problem and prescribed remedies for its solution is the most valuable state paper ever penned in reference to the evolution of colonial self-government. Lord Durham recommended the union of the two provinces, an increase in the numbers of the Legislative Council, a civil list for the support of the officials, a reform of municipal government, and above all, that the colonial executive should be made responsible to the colonial legislature. We are not now to consider the policy of establishing representative government in the North American colonies. That has been irrevocably done. The Crown must consent to carry on the government by means of those to whom the representative body has confidence. And again, the responsibility to the united legislature of all officers of the government, except the governor and his secretary, should be secured by every means known to the British Constitution. The governor should be instructed that he must carry on his government by heads of departments in whom the united legislation shall repose confidence, that he must look for no support from home in any contest with the legislature except on points involving strictly imperial interests. Durham's report is rightly regarded as the Magna Carta of colonial self-government. The home government accepted frankly and unreservedly the principles it enunciated and made it the basis of their policy. But unfortunately for himself, Durham was less circumspect in action than sagacious on paper. He had hardly set foot in Canada, May of 1838, when he outraged local feeling by the appointment of new and untried men to his executive council. That there was something to be said for a fresh start, for a council free from the influence of all local cabals, is undeniable, and Charles Buller has said it well. The proceeding was not an excess of the dictatorial powers with which Lord Durham was endowed, but that three out of four councillors should be his own private secretaries was regarded as an abuse of them, and worse was to come. On June 28th, the dictator issued an ordinance proclaiming an amnesty for all who had taken part in the late rebellion, with twenty-three exceptions. Of these, eight who had pleaded guilty of high treason, were exiled to Bermuda, and fifteen others, including Papineau, who had fled from Canada, were forbidden to return to it on pain of death. A loud outcry against these high-handed proceedings arose both in the colony and at home. The deportation of criminals to Bermuda was illegal, and the imperial government therefore decided to disallow the ordinance though they accepted a bill to indemnify the author of it. Lord Melbourne was aghast at Lord Durham's indiscretion. His conduct, he wrote to the Queen, has been most unaccountable. But to censure him now would either be to cause his resignation, which would produce great embarrassment and might produce great evil, or to weaken his authority, which is evidently most undesirable. 
Durham was deeply hurt at the disallowance of the ordinance, and in the proclamation announcing its disallowance, he justified his own conduct and censured that of the ministry at home. Having thus added to his original indiscretion, he determined to resign. On November 1, 1838, he left Canada, and on landing at Plymouth, he boasted that he had effaced the remains of a disastrous rebellion. As a matter of fact, there was some recrudescence of insurrection in both provinces immediately after his departure, but Sir John Colburn suppressed it with the loss of 45 British soldiers killed and wounded. The Durham Report was published in 1839, and the government, both in administration and legislation, acted forthwith upon its recommendation. To Poulet Thompson, Lord Sydenham, who succeeded Lord Durham as Governor-General, Lord John Russell wrote thus, Your Excellency must be aware that there is no surer way of earning the approbation of the Queen than by maintaining the harmony of the executive with the legislative authorities. In 1840, the Union Act was passed. It provided for the Union of Ontario and Quebec, for a Parliament of two chambers, a legislative council of not fewer than twenty persons nominated by the Crown for life, and an elected House of Representatives, and for a civil list. Of the responsibility of the executive there was, curiously enough, no mention. The English practice was implicitly presupposed, but not until the governorship of Lord Durham's son-in-law, Lord Elgin, was the principle explicitly affirmed. In 1847, formal instructions were sent to the governor to act generally on the advice of the Executive Council and to receive as members of that body those persons who might be pointed out to him as entitled to be so by their possessing the confidence of the Assembly. Thus was the central doctrine of Lord Durham's report definitely and finally accepted as the ruling principle of Canadian government. The same principle has since been extended to all the more important colonies in the British Empire. Lord Durham's brilliant but erratic career was closed by death in 1840. Lord Melbourne declared that he was raised, one hardly knows how, into something of a factitious importance by his own extreme opinions, by the panegyrics of those who thought he would serve them as an instrument and by the management of the press. The principal author of the Reform Bill of 1832 and of the Canadian Report of 1839, whatever his obvious failings, can hardly be so lightly dismissed. Footnote. This is not the place for a discussion of the difficult question of the authorship of the Durham Report. Wakefield thought it, Buller wrote it, Durham signed it, represents one estimate. End footnote. The government of Canada was not the only problem which troubled the first years of the Queen's reign. On May 8, 1838, the London Working Men's Association published a summary of their demands in a document subsequently known as the People's Charter. The points on which they insisted were six, annual parliaments, manhood suffrage, vote by ballot, the abolition of the property qualification for members of Parliament, payment of members according to the wholesome practice of ancient times, and equal electoral districts. This program was an exact reproduction of that which had been adopted in 1780 by the Society for Constitutional Information, a society founded by Major Cartwright and Horne Took, and patronized by Charles James Fox. Chartism, though newly baptized, was clearly, therefore, no new thing. The matter of Chartism, said Carlyle, is weighty, deep-rooted, far-extending, did not begin yesterday, will by no means end this day or tomorrow. What, then, was the genesis and meaning of the movement which reached a climax in 1838, and 1839. Chartism, said Carlyle again, means the bitter discontent grown fierce and mad, the wrong condition, therefore, 
or the wrong disposition of the working classes of england is the condition of the english working people wrong or is the discontent itself mad like the shape it took not the condition of the working people that is wrong but their disposition looking more closely we can discern that the chartist movement represented a mass of accumulated discontent evoked by three causes social economic and political the most serious feature of that day was the entire dislocation of social life due to the rapid increase in the wealth of the middle class and the consequently widening gulf between employers and employed down to the great industrial revolution england had been in a very real sense a community the events of the previous half-century had unhappily dissolved that community and had shattered the human ties which had bound man to man and class to class as a result england had become a mere aggregation of atoms disorganized discontented and antagonistic thus in eighteen forty five disraeli wrote of two nations between whom there is no intercourse and no sympathy who are as ignorant of each other's habits thoughts and feelings as if they were dwellers in different zones or inhabitants of different planets in the picture which he drew in sybil there may have been exaggeration but it was the exaggeration of a truth substantiated from such different quarters as mary barton yeast and alton locke not less serious than the social estrangement was the economic depression of the working classes also due to the industrial changes of the last half century a series of mechanical inventions had given a marvellous impetus to production wealth was increasing with unprecedented rapidity foreign trade was advancing by leaps and bounds but the artisans and labourers complained that for them things were not better but worse that trade was more shifty employment less constant that wages were stationary or falling and that food was getting dearer day by day there was wealth in abundance and created as they thought mainly by their labour and yet many of them were starving the problem seemed to be inscrutable in the midst of plethoric plenty the people perish. End of section 13